Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone back after the summer break to Imperial as One's Belonging series, where we explore the lived experiences of individuals from the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Individuals who are willing to share their experiences, share their life stories, and help us to understand how it is that they've gained their sense of identity and their sense of belonging. And I do say this every week, and I met this young man, Darren D'Souza, um, and he is a very special young man with a very interesting narrative, right? And he's also a senior policy and project offer, officer at London Higher, and we'll get into that. But Darren, I'd like to just welcome you, and I'm going to kick off by asking that first question, which I usually do, which is, can you tell us a little bit about what it is that gave you your sense of identity and your sense of belonging when you were growing up? Yeah. Well, first of all, Wayne, thank you very much. First off, for the introduction, um, I hope I live up to it, and the invitation. It's really special. Having, having seen sort of previous episodes and the, the storied guests you've had on, um, it feels very humbling to be in that, in that company. Um, it, it's a really interesting question. On the face of it, you, you think it might be a simple one, your sense of identity, sense of belonging. But I think for me, something that's my identity essentially has always been slightly confused because I have quite a sort of complex family background history, uh, mm. a very rich one. So ethnically, um, my family are from Goa, former Portuguese India, um, but I was born in South London. I've lived in Cambridge for the last 20 years of my life. My parents were both not born in India either. My dad was born in Nairobi in Kenya. He grew up there. My mum was born in, in Mozambique on the banks of the Zambezi River. Um, Two of their parents were born in India, two of their parents were born in Kenya. So there's sort of multiple generations of immigration and, and sort of transition um, in there. I think really what ties it together is very important. Growing up especially has been those sort of cultural aspects. So food, music, sport, and above all, sort of underpinning that is, is family, the people who experience that joy in food and company and music with. Um, so, I, I mean, I've... Also, I think as we've been discussing before, there's a there's a rich sense of I think oral tradition and being mm -hmm. it passing on stories. So growing up until today, I I I love hearing stories from my my parents and my my grandparents of their childhood, where they grew up, their experiences, um, and sort of transports you to another time, another place. That really makes you feel connection with where you came from. So I've always heard growing up, you know, my mum was one of ten growing from Mozambique. Um, her grand, her, my grandfather, her dad was a, a foreman in a sugar factory, but also a businessman who had, you know, the, the she always says 70,000 coconut trees, export, import, oil, soaps, textiles, all of that. My dad, uh, you know, very strongly identifies with, with being a Kenyan, Kenyan Asian. There's obviously a large community there. Um, but it's interesting because I think those are snapshots of different eras because they left those countries when they were quite young themselves. And so they tell us these stories I think, to keep those traditions and their memories alive especially with their parents. Um, as, as I think I've said before, my, both my grandfathers were uh, passed away when they were 48 years old in the 1970s and the 1980s. So, you know, as time goes on, memories fade, but it's important to sort of maintain those connections. And so growing up being, uh, you know, with my grandmothers and being with my extended family and being able to, to learn from them, listen to their stories, cook with them, you know, see the traditions of their grandmothers and really sort of be transported to that of the time and place of you know safety culture tradition um was very very special and it's something that's really important to this day because i mean for example i still in, in 27 years of my life i've never been to to india to see where my my grandparents are from yet obviously i hope to go there very soon we only went to to kenya to see where my dad was born and grew up for the first time last year when he turned 60. so that was the first time he'd been back since he left as a 12 year old uh, wow. first time in 48 years so he came to came to london um, when he was 12, grew up in, in South London, Crystal Palace. Um, and being able to see where he used to live, his old church, where my grandfather's buried, it was very, very special because it gives you that connection to place that I didn't have before. So the connection was through culture, traditions, music, song, food, family traditions, but that we'd never been to the place. And actually seeing those places still there was quite special to know that, you know, they don't exist just in my mind or in the sort of stories that have been passed down, but they are real, they're physical, and it's very, it's very proud, sort of poignant moments. And I think that also happened on my mum's side. So she grew up in, as I said, my dad moved to the UK from Kenya when he was 12. My mum 
was born in Mozambique, left during the Civil War, spent a few years in Goa, going to the boarding school before going to Portugal, where her father, my grandfather, is, is, is buried. Uh, and so during my year abroad at university, I, I lived in Lisbon, and then I was able to finally, again, see my other grandfather's resting place overlooking sort of the river uh, in Lisbon with some beautiful trees. And it was very, very special to, to again, find and actually experience and see someone that you've heard so much about, such warm stories about how they were as a person uh, and actually see them. So that's very much the identity side of things. And belonging, um, like I said, family plays a big part of that, extended family especially, but also through things like sport and community. So uh, I've been playing cricket actually for the last 15 years, every Saturday. And there's a big community of people that you, you know you can spend eight hours with every, every, you know, every weekend, not get tired of, and you really build that sense of friendship and community as it goes on. And actually that replaced every Saturday, you, you used to go to church. So I was an altar server. And that again was another sense of identity. So being from a very specific cultural background, um, obviously India is a massive country, over a billion people, but Goa is a very small state, smallest in India, about a million people. And only a very small subset of that were Portuguese speaking or Catholic as we are. Um, so again, having that sense of tradition and identity every Saturday and, when we were used to live in London, we used to go to church and then my grandmother would make a full English breakfast, but instead of toast, we'd have homemade chapatis, Kenyan style, um, which sort of really tied everything together. And that's what we, we always take with us. Um, so in a nutshell, that's, that's really the childhood sort of identity story. And I'm sure there's lots more. Um, one other thing to mention is that I said, uh, ha having that sense of connection to place is something that only developed sort of later on. Um, unlike my sort of my my best friends are half Peruvian, they're they're half from Manchester, half from sort of the mountains in very very remote Peru. They had a very different experience and cultural connection. So they grew up going to visit their grandparents and spending six weeks every summer in that village and having a deep connection you know, mm -hmm. to the earth. Something else that was enabled me to sort of build a connection was through sort of records and genealogy. So mm -hmm. when my grandmothers both turned eighty for the eightieth birthday, I made them family trees. And so I was able to do a bit of sort of archival research and digging and seeing, um, you know, building that family tree and picture, wider picture where we're from, where people were born, where they migrated to sort of their life stories and transitions and migrations. Um, and that also made things a bit more real and really sort of situated where I am culturally. You know what? You're a natural storyteller. I think that you're, you're a natural story. And why I say that is because in order to be a storyteller, you have to identify stories and, and hear the stories. And from the way that you've explained your family history, okay, I can sense that not that there was something missing, but you wanted to know more, right? Um, you wanted to know more about who your family are. And, and in doing that, you started to un unlock, unlock. What, I'm going to ask a, a kind of abstract kind of question. Sure. What was it that do you think, right, in the, your early years, which kept you, because there's so many other things that could have distracted you. So mm -hmm. what was it that kept you going back to the well, as it were, to find out about your, your ancestry? What was, what, yeah. what, what was that connection? That is, that's a very interesting question. And actually, I am probably atypical in the sense that, like I said, my mum, my mum is one of 10 mm -hmm. uh, children. Uh, I have 25 first cousins on that side. We're a very large ragtime, rag sort of rowdy bunch when we get together, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think having those regular family gatherings always makes you appreciate that sense of community and trust and safety and love that you build with them. Yeah. Um, but I think I'm atypical in the sense that amongst all of that and also on my dad's side, I, I was always the one as a child asking questions about, you know, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Um, tell me about your life before you came here. To my grandmother, especially. Um, and they would always tell me that oh, we've heard these stories so many times, but my grandmothers would always love telling me this. And it, would, it meant I could find out things that no one else had ever thought to ask for before or had heard before. So, for example, I was talking to my, my dad's mum about her childhood. She was born in India, but she moved, she was, uh, they moved to Kenya when she was six months old, and that's where she grew up. Mm -hmm. um, and I found out through just through asking her that during the Second World War, she was born in 1936. So when she was about six, five, six years old, she said that they got evacuated to Uganda under threat of invasion on the continent, which no one else had ever heard about before, but I'd managed to unlock that. And actually being able to piece things together made me want to know more and more and more. And I think uh, language plays a big part in that as well. So linguistically, we're quite diverse. Obviously my first language is English, 
my mum's first language is, is Portuguese growing up in, in Mozambique. My dad's family all spoke Swahili. Um, so, uh, and then there's obviously Konkani, which is the, the, the language of, of, of Go. Uh, well, so that's through the music. I think I've learned that. I don't understand it, but I can you know sing along to all the songs. Yeah. Um, Portuguese, I do speak. Uh, I did Portuguese at university specifically to learn more about my family and be able to do some research and, and connect more with the sort of the language in which records were kept sort of through the colonial period, especially um, when sort of record keeping was few and far between. Um, and I think being able to unlock a little bit more about the stories and piece things together was what came, kept me coming back from more in terms of knowing more and being, I think, I, I think inherently I'm quite curious. So it was always really interesting. And I've had that always had deep interest for history and, and culture and uh, sort of patterns and traditions. And uh, that, I think that's in a nutshell why. There's, I really like that. I, I really like that, that, in, that inquisition, that curiosity, the curiosity that kept you wanting to find out. Because I'll be honest with you, first time when I met you mm -hmm. um, and I heard your name and it was Darren D'Souza. Mm -hmm. And then when I saw you, my perception was, yeah. that doesn't look like a Darren D'Souza, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, because we all put... Um, not stereotypes, but we think of names and we think of yeah. who fits those names, Absolutely. right? So it was very interesting when we were having the discussion earlier where you spoke about the fact that your um, ancestral home yeah. goes back to Goa in India, but the Portuguese <laughs> side of that, were you able to get beyond? So where did the name D'Souza come from? Um, have you been able to go beyond that? Or is, is that kind of like a, a limitation, as it were? So that is, a, again, another interesting question. I think they will say, what's in a name? And yeah. I'm, I always, always joke that neither of my names match my face, as, as it were. So um, yes. like I say, it's a, it's a lot of, not preconceived notions, but you do sort of have connotations and you can guess or have informed guesses about uh, people's backgrounds and where they come from based on names. Um, the, the research I've done on my family tree is, is, is thrown up a lot more of Portuguese surnames. So mm -hmm. my, my mum's uh, surname is Menezes, which is, again, a good Portuguese surname. And being able to trace my family tree back about five, six generations, all of those have been completely Portuguese. So my um, grandparents were all born, uh, are named after the saints on whose day they were born. Um, my, my dad's name is Jerome because he was born on St. Jerome's Day. My, my maternal grandmother was called Lidwin because she's born on St. Lidwin's Day, the 14th of April. My, one of my aunts is called Esther because she was born on Easter. Um, and so, uh, and my great grandfather, as in my, my dad's granddad, was called uh, Pantaleon, which is the Saint, Saint Pantaleon, who was born on that day. I think as a form of record keeping on the sort of calendar of saints, it's even mm. if you didn't have a, a calendar there, you knew whose saints day it was, and you can trace back historical records that way, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think names always fascinated me as well. Uh, like I said, my mum is one of ten. They were named alphabetically A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. My mum is the third, so she's Carmen C. Yeah. Um, and my parents deliberately gave me and my sister one initial each. So my dad's name is David. My mum's Carmen. I'm Darren, and my sister is Caitlin. So we've got one initial each, and our you know our middle names are the other way around. So I think that's always been a very special sense of connection to my identity and heritage. Uh, and interestingly, uh, our name was previously spelt my both all our family's name with a, a D apostrophe, which is very common going spelling. Um, right. But it was being able to look through records and, and finding my grandfather and great grandfather's birth certificates and, and their uh, sort of uh, citizenship forms that we found the original spelling of our name as D-E-S-O-U-Z-A. So we then sort of changed that to reflect it. So it was a really, um, yeah. So again, the research has taken me in that direction. You know what, that that final part which you, you said, because we always, coming from the Caribbean and um, when you would register the birth of a child and, and you would find it's like I went to a friend's 90th birthday and there were people there um, when we were saying what the name of the person was, mm -hmm. virtually nobody in the audience knew what was the birth name of that individual. And it was, it's, so, it's so interesting that you were able to actually correct a misspelling, what something which you had, your family had associated with themselves, not even knowing that it wasn't who they are, if that yeah. makes sense. No, it's, it's actually that on my dad's birth certificate is spelt with an apostrophe, and I think 
uh, the, the story goes that my grandmother was annoyed that it was, I think it was a clerk or a nurse who had simply spelled it that way because they thought it looked better. But then being able to find my grandfather's birth certificate and sort of historical records, seeing the original spelling and being like, that is another sense of connection and identity that we've, yeah. we've you know, we've unraveled there, which was really uh, special to do. That's fantastic. And you also mentioned that um, when you decide, when you went to university, mm -hmm. It, it was part of an influence, the, the whole idea about wanting to know about your history was part of why you studied what you did. What did you study at university? Yes, so I did uh, a joint honours degree in, in history and Portuguese uh, at the University of Leeds. Uh, I was the first, first in my family to go to university, so my sister has since gone. She's got, she's got one more degree than I have now. Um, <laughs> but neither of my parents went. Of course, uh, first generation, a lot of my cousins have since you know been to university as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I, th I think it's interesting because... There's always that perception, I think, especially within Asian communities, about being, you know, doctors, lawyers, engineers, accountants, mm -hmm. very um, upright, you know, dignified professions. And I wanted to become a historian, and I was always interested in humanities and essay writing, which is perhaps obviously slightly atypical. But I think uh, my parents sort of realised and they were really sort of touched. But I think by reading my personal statement to university, so I've always been interested in history. And the reason I chose history in Portuguese as a joint honours was specifically to be able to obviously use those skills and learn more about first of all sort of Portuguese history as a sort of colonial power so the Portuguese were in charge of Goa for 450 years from mm -hmm. 1500 uh, from 1500 to 1961 they were mm -hmm. uh, sort of the colonial power there but it was then being able to use those skills and hopefully you know pick up the language and historical sort of acumen to then be able to do some more digging and genealogy and research and finding more um, about my family and their source language and so in my personal statement I, I specifically mentioned my my grandfather uh, in Mozambique uh, during the civil war when records were destroyed and not being able to then have anything uh, you know of his memory apart from I think two or three photos and one pin badge with his name which is all that my mum had and uh, she's quite stoic my mum but I think she 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 said she cried when she read my personal statement because of the sort of the the way in which I'd gone about it mm -hmm. and actually that had a very interesting sort of butterfly or domino effect as it were so like mm -hmm. I said I'd learned Portuguese I spent a year abroad at the University of Lisbon I did a summer scholarship there I did my dissertation uh, which meant I spent a week in the National Archives in Portugal and uh, through that we found where my grandfather was buried so I, I having done the archive and research in my third year I spent a week there um, we had never had any record of, of my grandfather apart from those photos so we went back to the National Archives, I think, about a year later. Uh, and then I went back to the same place. I had the sort of the, the documents and everything. And we poured through about five or six boxes of big historical dusty records. And you sort of just, you know, when lightning hits, I saw my grandfather's name and we found his, uh, his certificate, which then told us where he was buried and the exact place and location, which we were then able to go and see. So that was... Um, so that so was... you did... So before, before you had done that historical record, yeah. or that search yeah. you didn't know where your grandfather was buried we knew that he was we knew which cemetery it was but we, we didn't know whereabouts so this uh, this enabled us to to sort of ask a few different people the right questions to know where specifically it was or what, what happened to to him rather yeah. um uh, and then yeah that came to fruition so we were and then actually through that you see um i was able to get my great grandparents names because they're on the certificates as well so yeah. that was another step in building the family tree yeah so actually, you 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 were the real conduit of enabling your your mother, uh, your grand your grandmother. Was she still alive at the time? My my mum's mum is still alive. She's still alive. She so, yeah. She's she's eighty seven. Um, so so did did she, did she go back? Have you all been to see the place or is that, that's interesting? Um, my mum spent most of her teenage years in Lisbon, so the most of the nineteen eighties she was there. Yeah, and she hadn't gone back until 2014 that was the first time we all went as a family me and myself and my, mom, my dad uh, yeah. and my sister um and then i think it was only about 2018 19 that we went to the cemetery since then a lot of my mum's brothers and sisters have gone to lisbon and have done the same thing where every time we go someone lays flowers um it was the 40th anniversary uh, of his death last year so my, one of my uncles went and laid a little plaque because at the time after having uh you know lost everything during that transition from the civil war to Portugal yes. um they couldn't afford a proper gravestone so there was yes. a sort of an unmarked grave but then to be able to give them the dignity of having flowers which were uh and, and a name uh again from sort of unlocking and then yeah all the family being able to go over there now regularly creating that connection is wonderful 
I mean, that's slightly more accessible. On on my dad's side, as I said, we haven't been back in 50 years. Yeah. But the first thing we did on the first day was go to um, Langata Cemetery in, in Nairobi, which is where my grandfather's buried. My dad knew that. It's, it's, it's a very, it's a, again, another beautiful setting. It's uh, underneath uh, an airfield. So you see old planes fly by, which is very poignant because my, my granddad, my dad's dad was a, an RAF storekeeper. Mm-hmm. And it's also opposite Nairobi National Park, which is the only, I think, capital city in the world to have a national game reserve within its uh, borders. Mm-hmm. So the first thing we did, we went there. And my dad vaguely remembered whereabouts uh, his dad had been buried. But it's interesting because since then, a lot has happened. This is post-pandemic. So there was a whole wing of the cemetery that had been built with uh, pandemic deaths. And so it was increasingly hard to find. But we spent about half an hour wandering around. Um, and you could sort of see the patterns emerging in terms of dates and when, when people died. And like I said, I, I stopped in my tracks and I saw my grandfather's grave. It was sort of sunken in the ground, overgrown. Um, but we had some of the workers came over and said they would they would happily sort of spruce up. So they they clean the marble, they they reset it upright, and it was very very beautiful because the bit that had sunken underneath the ground was uh, my dad's name. So it had it had it had my granddad's name. It said loving father of, uh, but then all the children's names were hidden. So they were, you know, put back up and all clean. And then just two rows down was my dad's uncle who um, passed away two weeks before his his dad did. So his his very favorite uncle they were very close to, and we were also able to. Um, you know, clean that, lay flowers, and just sort of make it a bit more presentable. So it was very special to revive their memories because um, clearly they'd been untouched for fifty years. Yeah. No one had been back since they left because of because yeah. of the memories with, with which they left. You know, of having lost a parent and having lost everything and coming over and starting fresh. Um, but yes, it it, 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 it enabled closure. Or, it did. Or it, it it by closure, but it also opened a new chapter. Because you yes. were able to close the past, but actually reopen a future where where the family knew exactly where their ancestors were and were able to are able to go and visit and attend. It's amazing, and that's something very special. If you know, if I have children, I, I'm, I'd be very proud to be able to tell them that you know this is your great grandfather. This is where they are, both yeah. of them, uh, in you know in continents apart. So that I think shows the sense of sort of disparate identity. We're here in in the UK. One of my grandfather's in Lisbon, one's in, in Kenya. Um, I think that's sort of very poignant in the way it shows the sort of everything that's led up to this point. Yeah. Wow. I've t- wow. That is such an amazing, st- not, it's not, it is a story. As I said, you're a natural storyteller. But it's captivating to understand that journey that you, I, I, was, I was laughing to myself when you were saying, um, that you were in the National Archives in Portugal, right? And in fact, effectively, you were just, I'm not saying that this is the case, but were you just looking for your family history at that point, or were you researching something else at the same time? So is it the first time I went there to National Archives, it was, I think, in about January of my final year, specifically a week of doing archival research for my dissertation. Yeah. Um, and then I went, when I went back, I was unable to use those skills and contacts to then ask people if they had any records of my grandfather. And then I, I think I went to, it, it was, again, because colonial record keeping was very interesting and mm-hmm. who kept what when mm-hmm. is sort of critical to understanding where things might be. I think I went around three different sets of archives, so the National um, Maritime or, or, or Navy Museum, because everyone in as a Portuguese citizen had to do conscription. So my grandfather did his military service in, in Mozambique when he was there in the, in the 60s. Um, and then, yeah, again, the interesting thing is my dad was born th- um, two months before Kenyan independence in 1963. Uh, he's born in September, independence was December, but his birth was only registered in January mm-hmm. um, at, under the Kenyan government. And both his older siblings had had their births registered by the British government. So their records were, if you go here to the National Registry or Civil Registry, you can find their documents. But, you know, after th- that period ended, my dad's documents are now all in Kenya. So again, it sort of shows sort of the lasting effects of sort of the empire and colonialism in being able to access the information you might need to be able to yeah. tell stories like this. Yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing. But the the reason I was thinking, I would love to have been able to do as part of my degree just to look at my family history kind of thing. <laughs> you know, but it, it gave you the skills, it enabled yeah. you to 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 actually go and pursue your own passions, exactly. which I think is really important. Yeah, um, I th- I, it was nice to come good on my promise or my uh, ambition during that personal statement to be able to put my skills into practice. And that is what I sort of did. I married the, the historical record searching with Portuguese language skills 
that I'd learned. Mm-hmm. Um, and then being able to do that was very, it was a very proud moment. And also it's it's nice to be able to do something with my parents because it's something that they, as children, were never able to do. Obviously they were, they were grieving the loss of parents. They didn't have time to do all this bureaucracy or paperwork or spend time doing it. And so be, to be able to do that for them as well, it's been very um, amazing. cathartic. Yeah. Amazing that is, it's, um, it's amazing. It's, it's, that shows the, the love of your ancestry, the love of, of sure. knowing who you are, you know, yep. that's, it's really important. I mean, that's a, that's a very big driving force, especially growing up here as a, uh, as a minority. Um, mm-hmm going up in South London, going to an Irish Catholic school where everyone was was white, apart from, I think at the time, it was about 2001, there were about four or five of us who weren't white. Now mm-hmm. things are, are much, much more different, more diverse, but at the time it was still very challenging. I know we, we talked about this before, my dad moved here in, in 1976, he talks about, you know, Teddy Boys, the National Front, mm-hmm. the Broadwater Farm Rights, Brixton Rights, and, and the Sus Laws and things that came, mm-hmm. basically the, the racial and political context of the time. And you think, Early two thousands, very different, but I mean, the same things happened at school in terms of you know racism, yeah. bullying, and, you know playground stuff. Um, and I think you mentioned something really important the other day that the the times change, but the problems don't. They are the same problems of just of their time. Yeah, um, yeah, which is something I think that's always been yeah. important. And knowing who you are and where you come from is very important. And being able yeah. to to feel secure in and of yourself. Yeah. yeah. So when when you were growing up as you've mentioned, and mm. the, the experiences, because clearly you had this passion for um, history, yeah. but also thinking about the work which you do now, mm. um, which is a lot more social justice, etc. How mm. did you navigate your space, navigate into that space as well? That's, yeah, that's a very good question. I think in my head, I always think, oh, I just, I sort of fell into it. But actually, if you, if I look objectively, there was a sort of sustained career path in that direction. I mean, like I said, university changed my life and educational, higher education has been transformational for me. Mm-hmm. And I've always been a strong advocate of it. During my final year exams, um, we, we were, you know, all starting to look for graduate jobs. And people asked me what I wanted to do. And I joked that I wanted to, to, to wear a suit and to travel. So I went on the University of Leeds career website and filtered by international opportunities. And one that came up was for... A policy uh, intern in Brussels. So uh, the universities of Leeds, Sheffield, and York had a European office where you would do public affairs and communications and European Parliament engagement and stuff. I applied for that, and in the middle of my final exams, I actually got offered the internship, which was which was fantastic. So just after graduating, um, I had a month induction in, in Yorkshire, and then I was seconded to Brussels um, to do that. And so that was representing my university on a global, so international stage. Mm-hmm. I was able to organise events and meetings at the European Commission and the European Parliament. I think I said I have the dubious honour of being the person to organise the last ever event at the European Parliament hosted by a British MEP the week before um, Brexit happened. I was there during Brexit, which was quite a surreal experience um, as well, and being able to sort of build those connections. And then, like I said, I always had, I, because the university did so much for me, I always wanted to give back and promote sort of the, the benefits and the empowerment that it can give you. Mm-hmm. And so this job came up. And I applied for it as a policy advisor here. So championing London, again, where I was born, where my dad spent most of his childhood. My mum came here in 1989 as well. She lived in East London. My dad's from South London. Um, being able to represent the capital is a very, very powerful thing. And one of the first things that I got given to do, which was, um, was an invitation to take what was then the North London Leadership Programme, a bilateral programme between City University and London Metropolitan University uh, for global majority professionals uh, and mentoring. And bring it pan london so alongside emichi at london met we did a pilot now three years ago where we did where we had eight institutions we had about 56 people where we matched people from global majority backgrounds from sort of early to mid career both in academic and professional services with more senior counterparts at another university to really sort of address that diversification of talent issue that you know each and other sectors face where the further you go up the talent pipeline and then the hierarchy the fewer people from global majority backgrounds there are and also mm-hmm. doing things like giving them a professional, giving them the opportunity to build a professional network, which as you know, as black as brown people, we don't necessarily have the opportunity to do as much of. Um, and giving them support, so sponsored by Minerva and Executive Search from the ability to be in front of headhunters that make senior level recruitment decisions, hearing their insights on how to negotiate, how to navigate the headhunting and CV and, and cover letter process and 
those informal aspects that you might necessarily you know know about so there's informal interview stages the building connections um something else we've explored is the the barriers to work thing so they say as an early career professional what you know is very important your skill set your qualification the further on you progress it becomes who you know your connections your network um and the people that can help you get to where you want to go uh and being able to to recognize that that as a sort of fact in terms of professional progression and knowing the barriers to work that exists for global majority professionals for example how you dress how you're portrayed how you're perceived and be able to to work have an open space for people to discuss the challenges they face and being able to give them that safe sort of tailored space outside their institution to talk about anything that they might want to in terms of progression opportunities or or things they think that you know am i alone in this is this right and being able to talk to someone more senior who has gone through that and really lifting each other up has been a very very special and an important rewarding part of the work i've done and now that mentoring program has gone on for three years um mm-hmm. we're launching the fourth one soon uh, the deputy mayor for communities and social justice um gave us a, a shout out and so gave us a keynote speech of the mm-hmm. 2022 edition um it, you know aligns with the sort of broader priorities of, of the mayor for social and racial justice and mm-hmm. they have a strand on mentoring young people and supporting 10,000 black interns and through this we've been able to sort of secure some amazing speakers such as the ceo of the black talent charter and the ceo of action for race equality and uh hearing from people who sort of lay out the facts so i think often I mean, there's maybe a perception that why do we still need these initiatives? What's what's the point of them? When you look at the fact that London is a hyper diverse city, but the workforce does not represent that, or especially at senior level, and the stuff like progression and ethnicity pay gaps still exist. The facts that I think speak for themselves. And I think it's important for us to be able to to realise and recognise this, and then put in those place put in place those interventions to be able to address them. And so that again is universities. And giving back to them and I think that's the thread that I've since I graduated I, I, I left university but I never really left universities as a sector and I think yeah. you know I'm still so passionate about the transformational benefits they can have both in terms of education and professional progression um but that's why I've landed where I am no that's that's a, that's amazing and it was it I'm not gonna it's a bit of a kaleidoscope it's it was interesting where you spoke about um going and working in Brussels in the last days of before Brexit, and I can imagine that was could have been. What was that like? Um, how, how was that being a, kind of like a British? Uh, and we're saying, well, goodbye to you guys. What what did it feel like? It was it was it was very peculiar because I think obviously socio politically and culturally, it people felt very strongly about it in in many different directions. For mm. me personally, on on Brexit Day, thirty first of January, twenty twenty, I had a, a wonderful time. Mm-hmm. Purely not, not because of anything else that was going on, but because I got a phone call from the office of one of the MEPs uh, of Yorkshire who said, we're clearing out all our stuff. Do you want something? And I was like, absolutely. So I went to the European Parliament and I got given a flag of Yorkshire that they'd had hanging in their office that the MEPs had signed, which I have here. So yeah. um, then he sort of impromptu launched a sort of eight minute speech about um, how proud he was that we're still there as representatives of the UK uh, in the European Union. Um, and then... Obviously, that that evening there were sort of farewell parties for all the MEPs and their staffs who'd been who were no longer you know uh, part of the European Union, uh, and there was we went to a bar on, on the main square of Brussels where all the sort of bureaucrats and civil servants hang out and they played the European anthem on a violin at midnight before turning into Bittersweet Symphony by the Verve and then they played three hours of Britpop, so it was a very lively evening on, on Brexit Day which I think doesn't necessarily chime with the sort of wide experiences people had about sort of either depression or Mm-hmm. Uh, um, despair of leaving, leaving the EU but yeah. um, it was a very interesting time to be there politically because you know un- until January we were able to influence engage with the European Parliament have representation there um, and be able to be there as an equal partner and then after January suddenly we were a third country or the influence was no longer the same so we had to work in a different way to be able to achieve the same goals and, and ensure you, uh, you know other partners that we were still there and open and ready for collaboration and stuff like that so yeah. I'm 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 going I'm going abstract with you today. Yeah, please some do. The, right, because some of the stuff fresh. Which, which, which you've kind of like highlighted that kind of like that disconnection. Whereas, whereas before you were part of the gang, as it were, mm. and now you found yourself in a place where you no longer had influence and were no longer um, part of the in group, as it were. Yeah. What parallels do you can you draw from that in kind of like the work which you're doing? With the global majority versus um, 
it's, this is why I said it's abstract. You see, where, where you've got people who are in positions, but they're not being able to progress. Because mm. I, I, I see parallels between um, where, you, where they were, not saying that, that, we were, that we were ever in the position of being able to influence, but now you are definitely on the outside. And oftentimes when we're for um, black and minority ethnic communities, right? They often feel that they're on the outside, not able to have the influence that they know that they could have, which would yep. benefit so many people. It's, that is, if I'm not sure if I'm... No, I, saw, I, I see the parallels there, and it's interesting because that, that obviously there are a lot of intersections that play there. So race and ethnicity is one, mm -hmm. class and gender are others that sort of mm -hmm. compound experiences, as it were. So um, we, as part of the mentoring programme, we run something called Learning Leaders, which is a leadership development workshop mm -hmm. um, co-designed between ourselves, myself, the University of Westminster, an academic there, and a change and transformation specialist who's, who sort of delivers stuff to civil service and foreign governments. Mm -hmm. Um, and this year's cohort were exclusive. I mean, obviously, everyone's grown majority, but this year mm -hmm. we had six women. And so that intersection there led, so it unlocked something completely different um, in terms of uh, the experience and lens they were able to shed on their problems or challenges they faced. But, you know, being from ethnic backgrounds, but also then being women, not being taken seriously and sort of seeing mm -hmm. what's happened there. And I mm -hmm. think. A lot of different groups that have been disadvantaged, not just racially. Um, I think I think there's an adage: it's a big club and you're not in it, but you can feel yeah. that very very strongly. Mm -hmm. And it's about building your own community and sense of belonging. So that's why I think particularly this we've been very strong on trying to get everyone to build a professional network of colleagues across the sector, not just from you know similar backgrounds to to ours, but also allies that you know can champion you and will be that voice at uh, you know a vice chancellor or, or president level, um, and I mean, you, for example, to look sort of another field, uh, look at politics. Diane Abbott was the first black woman elected to parliament, and to this day, as a you know, as a trailblazer, as a history maker, she still suffers the most abuse out of anyone. Yeah. Um, as an MP, and yeah. obviously, race and gender have intersected there and compounded that sort of experience that she's had. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, that's a really good parallel that you've 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 put there in terms of Diane Abbott. She's in the room, but but some would argue that she's never actually been fully included, even though she's held positions yes. and, and stuff like that. She's never fully been accepted and recognised for what she's contributed, you know. Uh, yes, exactly. I think that, that phrase you said, in the room but not included, is very is, is one that I think leads a lot of people, especially from backgrounds like ours, to, to have that imposter syndrome where they mm -hmm. are, they, you know, they might come to a time where they are the person in that room, but then they feel like, oh, I shouldn't be here, or I'm the only one here, or I'm here as a token representative, I'm here mm -hmm. on merit. And I think being able to, to unpick and undo those, things, those thoughts and, and sort of believing in yourself and you know, your convictions and, and how you got to where you are is very important to go some way into feeling like you're included. And I suppose part of that is elbowing your way in and being like, I deserve to be here as much as everyone else does, yeah. which is, again, easier said than done. I think that none of us particularly feel comfortable doing that but yeah. uh sometimes you know comfort leads to complacency and people will just keep on including but not including you yeah you know if you get away with it but it takes really sort of bold and uh courageous people to go actually no this is wrong or actually let me pick you up on that or let yeah. me say something that sort of shifts the dynamic and again there's a thing where people from global majority backgrounds especially women if they speak up they're, they're told they're a troublemaker or they're being problematic or aggressive but it's sometimes it has to be your cross to bear. My, I was talking to my dad about this earlier because we were talking about, you know, experiences growing up. And I asked him how he felt growing up in the 70s and 80s in South London as a, as a you know, as an Asian child, basically. And it was interesting because obviously there's a lot of, I think there can be a lot of fear. But he said to me, he was like, I was never scared. I always stood up for myself. It's like no one else was going to. I had to make a stand. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just very... It's interesting because you can think at any time that could go wrong, being one person in the sea of others, you're willing to say, speak up or, or fight back. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's led him to be where he is in terms of not taking things from anyone that he doesn't have to and mm -hmm. sort of instilling that sense of, uh, I belong here as much as you mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask a, a 
I've got a couple. If anyone else has any questions, just raise your hand. But other than that, I've got a couple more questions. Yeah, please. Throughout all of this journey which you've been on, okay, how has it helped to develop your sense of belonging and sense of identity at each of those different stages? Like when you started to uncover your yeah. history, etc. How did that make? How did that make you feel? I think university was very uh, pivotal to that. So being able to learn Portuguese as a language, the language of my sort of my family from scratch and being immersed in cultural studies, then spending a year abroad there learning about um, the history of Portuguese empire and colonial relations was another thing that made me feel part, let's say part of the in-group. So someone navigating that from being part of that background in history. And it took a lot of the, I mean, the old adage is it takes a village to raise a child. But in, mm -hmm. in the case at university, I had a wonderful support system in the, fact, in the sense of my, my personal tutors and my uh, my lecturers in Portuguese who constantly pushed me to do things which I maybe would have been too shy to take advantage of before then. So I think um, there were things like uh, competitions where we had to write a short story or do a book review that my teacher was like, you'd be great for this. Why don't you apply? And so I did. And I won those ones. Uh, and then I won that scholarship to the University of Lisbon mm -hmm. as a summer school. My personal tutor was like, there's this fantastic leadership development opportunity um, mm -hmm. in New York, which I think you should apply for. And then I was one of 14 out of 100 to be selected to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think inherently I'm quite, maybe I'm not as bold. And I'm, I, I feel like I'm quite introverted, uh, mm -hmm. but it takes people to pull you out of your shell and believe in you for then, mm -hmm. you know, for you then to be able to believe in yourself. I think be, having that support and guidance from them, I think made me feel like I did belong at university, especially as a as a someone from a fairly bit, sort of very normal mm -hmm. background. But you you know going to Russell Group University, you see a lot of people from this. That was the most privately educated people I'd ever met in my life to that mm -hmm. point, and it was a sort of different world. And looking their experiences and and hearing how they grew up and the, you know the family homes they come from, um, and you always feel that sense of unease around them, especially someone who doesn't you know for example doesn't come from as much. But then being able to sort of flourish academically gave me that sense of belonging in the university community. Another very important thing was uh, volunteering mm -hmm. and community building. So when I was at sixth form, one of my friends uh, died by suicide uh, mm -hmm. and, his, and his, his dad set up a charity in his name, the Mind Led Trust, and then later went on to co-found the Zero Suicide Alliance nationally. And it's had mm -hmm. a huge impact there in terms of sort of mental health and prevention. Whilst at university, I volunteered for Nightline, so the mm -hmm. student-led, student-focused listening service. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a, a community of very, very committed, dedicated volunteers that really prioritizes mental health, community building and support for everyone. And being part of that group really made me feel like I belonged and gave mm -hmm. me a sense of identity, sort of purpose and belonging mm -hmm. whilst at university. Um, and I think, like I said, it's those community aspects that, that really lift you up. I think mm -hmm. You can't go through it all alone. So finding those places where you, you can feel at ease and feel like you belong. Mm -hmm go a long way to supporting you and think your individual progression and journey oh, every time you every time you say something something then pops into my head and i think i need to find out a little bit more just in terms of did you have mentors because it sounds it sounds as though there were a lot of people who along yeah. your journey even if you even if it wasn't on your radar or you hadn't yeah. noticed or known about it there were people who were willing to say have you considered this have you considered that yes i mean that is yes funny to say that having being the organizer of a, of a mentoring program i have never formally had my own mentor mm -hmm. but as i say informally or you know through seeing something in me i've had people who have been very strong supporters of me and have pushed me to do that and i think without them i wouldn't have taken the opportunities i did but i'm very glad that because they sort of they ended they led me to where i am now and if i look back on them they think it goes back to having you know those champions in your in your family or your parents and your and your grandparents who adore you and tell you you can be anything you want to be mm -hmm. then it's your you know the friends you make very close friends that, uh you know as you grow up you through education through university that support you and uh tell you that you know you'll succeed in your career those people at university are like these are great opportunities you should take them being it sort of giving you the cover to say yes okay i'll go for it i have no fear of failure here because i know regardless i've tried and i have people who will support me Otherwise, in this as well, I mean, sort of regularly interact with sort of senior leadership universities, vice chancellors, deputy vice chancellors, deans, provosts, and some of them are the most fantastic people you'll meet who 
so who see you and value the work that you do and then champion you and put you forward for opportunities. So with Dr. Randy Arlock at Westminster, who uh, I did the leadership workshops with, we co-authored a paper on the effectiveness of um, mentoring as, a, as an intervention for public workforce development. Mm-hmm. And so in July this year, just two, just about two months ago, um, I presented at the International Administ- International Association of Schools and Institutes of, Association, of, of Administration, IASIA, their annual conference in South Africa uh, wow. for their working group on gender di- diversity and equity. Uh, and again, that was something that we mentioned as a pipe dream that we might get this paper accepted. And then we did. And then suddenly we got the invite. And then we and then I was there in Bloemfontein. And then I was presenting to a committee of uh, people who are very storied and very accomplished professors and on the UN Committee of Experts in Public Administration. And I was there feeling like I'd just started my career. I shouldn't be telling them what to do. But that was another opportunity. I had sort of that, that informal mentor in Randia that led me to believe that, go on, let's submit this paper. Let's see what happens. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah. But then, you know, I was there, it was supported. And that was another opportunity that I had to sort of showcase the work we're doing and, and sort of shine a light on London as an example of best practice worldwide, yeah. which was pretty special. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing what you've been able to achieve um, by seizing opportunities that have been presented to you. Even if you don't know that, you don't know where they're going to lead, at least, and I think it goes back to the point which you made at the very start about being curious, right? Yes. Because I think anyone who's curious is also adventurous at the same time. <laughs> it's almost like they're, they're, they're the same side of they're the same side of the coin because you can't be curious or you can be curious and lazy and just not do anything about it. Yeah. And then in which case I th- say you're not really that curious. But when you're curious and you act upon that curiosity, yeah. you then become adventurous. If that so, makes sense. Uh, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And actually, I, I would never consider myself to be personally quite adventurous. But as you say, if someone tells me something, I'm like, yeah, but why is that? Or what, what else is there to it? And then it you know, eats at me until I find out more. I go and do that research or I go to those places and, and be like, ha, there we are. Yeah. And yeah. so it, sort of, it does, yeah, yeah, lead you to those places. Um, yeah. And <laughs> I, I'd never thought about that way. So that's very... <laughs> Yeah. No, it's, it's, it was just as you were saying, because it's opened up those doors, because yeah. in, in all of the things, your curiosity has led you to go back to your, your ancestral homes, yeah. to identify where your parent, where your grandfathers have been buried. And I think that curiosity sort of engenders um, authenticity when yeah. you speak. So when you, when you speak on something you've then experienced or found out more about or had a deep connection to, you can then speak with more sort of purpose and meaning. I think that's very important through the mentoring program and also other initiatives we've we've done. Uh, it's important for people to to look at it and see that you're not just doing this because you have to, or it's a part of your work, mm-hmm. but you truly believe in it and you are mm-hmm. there to sort of drive that mission forward. So that we talk about diversification of the talent pipeline, um, and you know nationwide. I think the latest HESA data shows that I think only one percent, nearly or not even one percent of professors in the entirety of the UK are black, which that's is right. mind boggling. But then being able to have those experiences behind you and actually then you sort of, when you build a reputation for yourself people take you more you know more seriously they take you they come to you for guidance and trust and advice and then you're in a position where you can then champion causes and sort of um build opportunities for others and i think we always we will stand on the shoulders of those who come before us and i think it's very important that we um i think that's what it's quite that we, we we build that bridge for our ambitions but we don't build a wall between ourselves and where we came from that's right. so you are taking the past with you as you go forward I like that. I'm going to end on that. I, I love that <laughs> quote. I, I, it's the first time I'm hearing it, but I understand because so often it seems that people make it through, but they don't allow others to come behind. But, exactly. And yeah. I, think, I think you can, you, can, you can do that, but then what does that achieve, really? Nothing. Of that, exactly. you know, there's, there's one thing. I remember being uh, on a school bus when I was about 12, 13 years old, and someone just randomly went, what is the meaning of life? And then someone offhand just so it always stuck me. They just generally went to to leave the world in a better place than you found it. And I think that's that that is something said offhand on a school bus 12, 13 years ago, but it stuck with me ever since. And I think that's something that always I take with me where I go. It's like it's it's all well and good, you know, being able to do these conferences and and being in those leadership programs and winning all these awards. But then if I don't do anything with them or if I don't try and advance society and make, you know, work towards more equality, what will the point of it been? And so I think that's Fantastic. the sort of curiosity to, to drive forward. But. Brilliant. 
I, I, I've still got two final questions. And yeah, these please. really are my two final questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and it's going to be, I always, uh, I always close off by asking the question, what advice would you have given to your younger self, mm -hmm. one? And then the flip side of that is, what do you think your younger self would look at you now and say, wow? Yeah, the advice I, I'd give my young self would probably be to be bold, take those opportunities that present themselves to you. Um, they, they won't just land in your lap, you have to work towards them, which I think I have done since mm -hmm. then, which has been um, positive. But start thinking about them, perhaps not in isolation, but where they might lead to in general. So this is a leadership programme. This is a short course. This is a speaking engagement. But what can that lead to? You start building your networks. You are then able to bring people along for the ride and build them up with you as you go along. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the advice I would give. I think, uh, yeah, be bold. That was something that I, I got told when I was, I think, five years old, like I said, at primary school. Uh, growing up, it was still very tough. I, you know, in the first day uh, as a, at reception, I got told to go to the back of the line because I, was, I wasn't white. Um, mm -hmm. And that sort of carried on several incidents you know, growing up. But then I once came home to uh, my headmistress sitting in our living room with a cup of tea, which was very, a surreal experience. And she went, you've got to stand up to these people. You've got to be bold. You've got to back yourself. And as a, as a small Asian child, you don't necessarily think that you can do that. But at some point you you build enough networks and you know that you have that network of support and community and family around you to be able to take those risks and challenges. And so being able to be confident in having those people to support you means that you can then take the next step forward. So trust mm -hmm. your people around you and take those opportunities. I think it would be the advice mm -hmm. I would yeah. give my own self. In terms of what they would say now uh, and say, wow, I think, I, I mean, the South, South Africa was good. I mean, being able to present international conference, um, another piece of work that I had was cited in a UNESCO report. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I, I graduated top of my degrees, disciplines for both of them, which is, mm -hmm. for me, I think my proudest achievement because being a, a sort of historian and massive nerd meant that I took that really seriously and it was really proud to see that happen, I think. Working in Brussels, that's another thing, being able to have done an internship in New York. I think all those things I did individually at the time, think, oh, these were good. And this, I just sort of fell into them as I went along. I think my younger self would be like, that's great. You've done that. But the job is not done. You can be proud, but you shouldn't be complacent. So go like take it. them, build on them, and actually keep doing things that, you know, make things better for everyone. Darren, you're an inspiration. No, just... not to, uh, no seriously, you're an inspiration for someone so young. Um, you've you've identified what your purpose is, and even if it's even if it's not clearly mapped out, yeah. you know you've you've already started to establish yourself in terms of making sure that you're making the right connections to enable that vision that you have to become a reality, to leave the world in a better place than where you found it, you know, and that's inspiring for everybody, you know, well, that really is. Yeah, okay. I, hope, I hope the entire conversation wasn't too abstract. I think there might have been no. things that we would have learned. <laughs> it's, 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 I, I, I just I love the way in which you connected that family history because your family. Imagine if you hadn't done that research, your grandfather's gravestones mm. would still be dilapidated somewhere in Portugal right now, mm. right? And your uncle's gravestone, and no one would know where they are. And that's part of our family being lost. We're not connecting with mm. our history. But you undertook that because of that inner desire. It's part of your purpose. You yes, and, and as I said, a, a lot of that comes from having connection to, to people and, and cultures and traditions that exist maybe in my heart and mind, but not, you know, not the places and being able to then vividly see them and be like, this is where we came from. This is where we are. I want everyone to know about it. I'm very proud yeah. of it. Um, yeah. So. Absolutely. Keep doing what you're doing. We're, we're, you. we're, 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 I know that Imperial are, are always involved with, with the um, London hire and the mentoring scheme. And yeah. I'm going to use this as a, a catalyst to say, you know what, let's get more involved because I think what you're doing is a great thing. Okay. Well, I mean, I, thank you again for the invite. I, I, you know, there's been 170 guests before me and I hope I've, I've lived up to some of their fantastic experiences and, and stories like i said i'm not that far along in my career so listening from those that come before us and, and learning from them is something that i'm really keen to do and take absolutely. forward in the work that we do absolutely thank you very much i'm well, gonna just, i'm gonna just share with with everyone what's going to be happening 
in our next um, edition of Belonging. Let me see if that comes up. So next week we're going to have Baba um, Jalo um, Ipiga, and he is a marketing that he's, he's done so many things, creative things, but he's also involved with um, promoting the Rio Co Richard Coker um, sickle cell organized Richard Coker Foundation, which is looking at individuals who have sickle cell and providing a narrative and awareness of their experiences. I don't know if you know, but this month, September, is Sickle Cell, sickle cell Awareness Month. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be focusing in on having a, a, a greater understanding of what it is to live with sickle cell, to help others to be encouraged by it, etc., because it's something that we need to do. Um, and then if you have missed any of the others, and um, there was a, a, a bit of an archive developing now, please go to our YouTube channel, which is tinyurl.com forward slash belonging dash IAO. And you'll be able to hear many of the wonderful stories and you'll be able to hear Darren's very shortly again, um, because I think they all give us an idea of what it actually means to gain our sense of identity and belonging. So Darren, and for all of the other guests who are here with us today, I want to just say a big thank you and join us again next week where we'll start our sickle cell focus. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Just... Mm -hmm.